Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com. A-A-R-O-N-V dot com. Making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. You're listening to episode 181 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about D.B. Cooper, the mysterious hijacker who got away. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. On November 24th, 1971, 50 years ago this very week, a man calling himself Dan Cooper boarded a plane in Portland, Oregon. He was taking a short 30-minute flight to Seattle, but when the plane took off, it was the beginning of a multi-hour ordeal. Cooper revealed himself to be a hijacker, and he demanded hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash. Then, donning a parachute, he jumped out of the airplane and into the night, and he's never been seen since. So who was Dan Cooper? How did he execute this daring plot, and what happened to him afterward? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, let's start off by clearing up something people may be wondering about. In the opening segment, I referred to the man at the center of today's mystery as Dan Cooper, but almost everyone knows him as D.B. Cooper. So what's the, why the difference? It's because the media screwed up. Uh, as I've noted, especially today, the media is not very good at its job. And even though it was better at its job in 1971, it still had lots of screw ups. And um, this was one of them. The, when the man who purchased his ticket to get on the plane back in 1971 did so, he gave the name Dan Cooper. And that was almost certainly not his real name, but an alias he'd chosen for himself. And that in itself may be of interest, because in Europe there was a comic book about a character named Dan Cooper. The fictional comic book Dan Cooper is a test pilot for the Royal Canadian Air Force, and his stories involve things like him jumping out of planes with parachutes and ransom money being delivered in knapsacks. So you can see the similarities. And some have speculated that our hijacker chose the alias Dan Cooper in honor of this character who he may have seen in European comics if he ever served in the military and was deployed in Europe. That's speculation, but for whatever reason, our hijacker decided to call himself Dan Cooper, and the media messed up. The night of the hijacking, a reporter from the Oregon Journal phoned someone at the airport, got the name wrong, and then it ended up in the United Press International Wire story and went all over the world, cementing the name D.B. Cooper in the popular imagination. There's a little bit more to that, but we'll talk about that later. Okay. So commercial aviation has changed a lot in the last five decades and in ways that are important to our story. So what was going on a plane like in 1971? It was extremely different, and someone today would have basically no chance of pulling off what D.B. Cooper did back then. In fact, his case contributed to the changes that airplane passengers experience because they tighten security procedures to stop things like this from happening. But yeah, taking an airplane was extremely different back in 1971. For a start, you didn't need to book ahead. You could just walk up to an airline ticket counter and book book your flight. You didn't have to do it in advance. It didn't matter if you were booking a one-way trip or a two-way trip because there was no homeland security looking for one-way, one-way passengers. You could pay cash, and you didn't have to show your driver's license, which is how Dan Cooper was able to get away with using an alias because nobody checked his identity. You then went directly to the plane and got on. You did not have to pass through security screenings. You did not go through a metal detector or get x-rayed. You did not have to take off your shoes, your belt, or remove objects from your body. You did not have to answer questions, and nobody looked in your luggage or carry-on items. Your loved ones could also come up to the gate with you as you departed, or they could come to the airport where you were arriving where you were arriving, and meet you at the gate because they didn't have to go through security either. 
While on board the plane, you took a seat which was bigger and more comfortable than the ones we have today. You could smoke on board the plane, and they didn't care if you did because it was a normal part of the culture. You did not have to keep your seatbelt fastened at all times, and you could get up and walk around. You could even visit the cockpit, and pilots often invited children to come up into the cockpit to see how the plane worked, and then the pilots would give the kids wing pins to commemorate the visit. They would give you free food and soft drinks on the plane, and the food was often really fancy, like roast beef or lobster, and it was included in the price of your plane ticket. They gave you real metal knives and forks to eat your meal. The flight crew did not give the passengers a constant stream of orders or threaten you with massive fines for disobeying them. And they didn't jam the seats together the way they started doing later on to maximize profits. So flying was a much more relaxed experience in a lot of ways. I'm sure there was a downside though, right? Well, of course, I mean, for a start, there was no Wi-Fi or USB recharging ports, but then nobody had smartphones or laptops or similar devices because they hadn't been invented yet. And there was no personalized entertainment console. More importantly to my mind, though, while airplanes were still safe, they weren't as safe as they are today. And because there was no such thing as GPS, the navigation was more complex and less precise. And then there was airline hijacking, which back then they called skyjacking. This really was the golden age of hijacking, wasn't it? Yeah. Airplane hijacking had gotten its start early, uh, one of the first con confirmed cases being in 1931, but it grew pretty slowly. Then in the 1960s, there was a massive uptick with 100 cases occurring in the United States in the 1960s with a 77% success rate on the part of the hijackers. The other 23% of the time, the hijacking was foiled. Between 1968 and 1972, there were 326 hijacking attempts in the world, meaning that one was occurring every 5.6 days. So the D.B. Cooper story really does occur during the golden age of hijacking between 1968 and 1972. Basically, there were two types of hijackers. Those that wanted to be taken somewhere, so they wanted transportation, and those who wanted money, or both. For the first kind, those who demanded transportation, they frequently wanted to go to Cuba. Of the 111 transportation hijackings in the U.S. between 68 and 72, 90 of them wanted to go to Cuba. That means 81% of the time, U.S. hijackers wanting transportation wanted to go to Cuba. And this led to stereotypes in the entertainment industry of the time of hijackers getting on planes and then demanding to be taken to Cuba. In fact, there's an old Monty Python sketch where John Cleese seizes control of a bus and says, take this bus to Cuba, as if a bus in England could cross the ocean and go to the island nation. I remember that one. So by today's standards, it seems rather dodgy to make fun of hijacking like that. So why were they treating the subject so lightly? Because at the time, hijackings were mostly an annoyance. Uh, the hijackers weren't trying to kill people. They just wanted to go somewhere or get money. As a result, a uh, lot of, of popular TV shows and magazines saw this as a relatively harmless annoyance that could be the subject of humor. Time magazine even ran a humor piece called What to Do When the Hijacker Comes. And because hijackers usually weren't bent on killing people, the standard advice at the time was for flight crews and passengers to cooperate with them and give in to their demands. All that changed when 9-11 happened because it could no longer be taken for granted that hijackers just wanted transportation or money. They could be built on killing people no matter what they told you. So today you'd never have crew and passengers just passively going along in the same way. In fact, the situation started changing during the events of 9-11 when the passengers on Flight 93 voted to rebel against the hijackers and try to regain control of the plane. They realized that was their only chance of staying alive, and it's a tragedy that they weren't able to retake the plane. 
though they were able to keep it from crashing into its intended destination, which Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Ramzi bin al-Sheib have said was the U.S. Capitol building. Both because of the increased security measures and the change in attitude towards hijacking, it's much less common today. But back in 1971, hijackers weren't perceived as the violent killers they are now, and so things were much more relaxed and tight security measures had not been implemented. And that sets the stage for D.B. Cooper to enter our story. So how did that begin? It started on November 24th, 1971, the day before the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States. In Portland, Oregon, in the afternoon, a man calling himself Dan Cooper approached the ticket counter of Northwest Oriental Airlines, which is what Northwest Airlines was called at the time. He paid $20 in cash for a one-way ticket from Portland to Seattle. And if you know your U.S. geography, Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington are not very far apart. They're almost kind of like sister big cities. Um, after all of the inflation that the government has caused in the last 50 years, the $20 he paid would be equivalent to $130 today. Uh, Cooper booked passage on Flight 305, which was scheduled to leave at 2.50 p.m. How would he have struck people? Did he look odd in any way? Not really. Here's the description of him that the FBI put out after the fact. Race, white, sex, male, age, mid-40s, height, 5 foot 10 to 6 foot, weight, 170 to 180 pounds, build, average to well-built, complexion, olive, Latin appearance, medium smooth, hair, dark brown or black, normal style, parted on the left, combed back, sideburns, low ear level, eyes, possibly brown, during latter part of flight put on dark wraparound sunglasses with dark rims, Voice. Low. Spoke intelligently. No particular accent. Possibly from Midwest section of U.S. Characteristics. Heavy smoker of Raleigh filter tip cigarettes. Wearing apparel. Black suit. White shirt. Narrow black tie. Black dress suit. Black rain type overcoat or dark top coat. Dark briefcase or attache case. Carried paper bag 4 inches by 12 inches by 14 inches. Brown shoes. The FBI bulletin doesn't mention it, but he was also clean shaven, so no beard or mustache. The fact he was perceived as being in his mid 40s suggests that he was born around 1926. In 1971, his weight of around 175 pounds was totally normal for a six foot tall man, as this was before the epidemic of obesity that was produced by the government's bad dietary advice due to the FDA being in the pocket of the food industry. And the fact he was wearing a suit was normal, as this was fairly standard plane attire at the time. People would get dressed up and wear suits on planes, not track suits or pajamas, as you sometimes see now. So all in all, he was a pretty normal looking nondescript type man. And what happened next? He got on the plane and took a seat near the back. The plane was about a third full, and he had a choice of seats. He ordered a bourbon and soda while the plane was waiting for takeoff. Then after the plane took off, uh, and shortly afterwards, Cooper turned to the stewardess who was sitting near him in a jump seat. Her name was Florence Schaffner. He handed Schaffner a note, and she put it in her purse without reading it, thinking that he was a businessman giving her his phone number, which was a fairly common way of trying to pick up women at the time. But Cooper wasn't a lonely businessman trying to pick up a pretty stewardess, so he leaned towards her and whispered, Miss, you better look at that note. I have a bomb. Needless to say, she took a look at the note. It was written in neat capital letters with a felt-tip marker, and it said that he had a bomb in his briefcase. Cooper then told her to sit next to him, so she did, and then asked to see the bomb. He opened his briefcase, revealing what looked like eight sticks of dynamite, four strapped on top of four, with a bunch of red wiring and a large battery. Upon closing the briefcase, Cooper told her his demands. He said he wanted $200,000 in, quote, negotiable American currency, close quote. 
And after the inflation that the government has caused in the last 50 years, that would be equivalent to $1.3 million today. He also wanted four parachutes, two primary ones and two reserve chutes, and he wanted a fuel truck standing by in Seattle to refuel the plane. At this point, Florence was becoming visibly agitated and having some trouble controlling her emotions, but Cooper had a calm demeanor and helped her calm down. She then went up to the cabin and told the pilot about the situation. When she came back, Cooper had put on dark sunglasses that you'll see in today's episode artwork. So she got a look at him both before and after he was wearing the shades, which is why the FBI came up with two drawings. The pilot, Captain William Scott, contacted SeaTac, or the Seattle-Tacoma Airport, which got on the phone with local and federal authorities. At this point, were the passengers aware that anything unusual was happening on the plane? No, the flight crew kept that quiet. Uh, They told the passengers that their arrival in Seattle would be delayed due to a minor mechanical difficulty. And they kept the plane in a holding pattern over Puget Sound for two hours while people on the ground were figuring out what to do and making preparations. Ultimately, Northwest Orion's president decided to pay Cooper's ransom demand and ordered his employees to to cooperate with Cooper. Seattle police and the FBI started to get the money and parachutes ready, as well as getting emergency responders on hand for when the plane landed at the airport in case they were needed. During this period, did Cooper reveal anything that could provide clues to his identity? At least a couple of things. At one point, he remarked to a different stewardess named Tina Mucklow that it looked like they were flying over Tacoma indicating that he likely could recognize the city from the air and had some familiarity with it. He also commented that McCord Air Force Base was about a 20-minute drive from the SeaTac Airport, which even more clearly underscored his knowledge of the area. Most people would not know the driving times from local airports to local military bases, so that suggested he might have connections with the aviation industry, the military, or both. A lot of hijackers in this period had a reputation for coming across as crazed, aggressive criminals hyped up on adrenaline and barely in control of themselves. How did Cooper strike the flight crew? Not at all like that. According to Tina Mucklow, He wasn't nervous. He seemed rather nice. He was never cruel or nasty. He was thoughtful and calm all the time. And how thoughtful Cooper was has contributed to his legend. He was sort of a gentleman hijacker, which made him more memorable and won him more favor than hijackers normally get with the public. When he ordered bourbon and soda, he paid for it and even tried to give the change to the stewardess. He also offered to have meals brought in for the flight crew while they were on the ground so they wouldn't be hungry once they took off again. So he was a thoughtful criminal. And what was happening on the ground? Did the authorities try to rig the money they were getting so it would be easy to trace? To get him the $200,000 he demanded, they got $10,020 bills. There were 100 packs of $120 bills each. They didn't mark the bills, but they did take photos of them on microfilm, so they had all the serial numbers on file. McCord Air Force Base also offered military-grade parachutes, but Cooper rejected these and insisted on civilian parachutes that could be manually operated. So they went instead to a local skydiving school and got them there. The fact he had insisted on four parachutes, two primary ones and two reserve chutes, was clever because it meant they couldn't rig the chutes. Why would they want to do that? Well, I don't know that they would, but if he'd only asked for a single primary and reserve chute, that would mean he would be jumping alone. So if they wanted to kill him, they could simply give him defective parachutes that wouldn't work right and he would plummet to his death. That would be an aggressive and possibly illegal way for the authorities to deal with Cooper, but it would be effective. However, since he demanded enough parachutes for two people... That suggested he was likely to force someone else to jump with him. And that meant the authorities couldn't rig any of the chutes because they didn't know which ones Cooper would be wearing. If any of the chutes was rigged to malfunction, 
they could be causing an innocent member of the flight crew or even a passenger to plummet to their death. And that would mean a major legal headache for the authorities with lawsuits, large payouts, and jail time in their future. So by demanding enough parachutes for two people, Cooper protected himself. How long did it take for the authorities to get everything ready? The plane had been in a holding pattern for about two hours when, at 5.24 p.m., the crew informed Cooper that all the preparations had been made. They ended the holding pattern and landed 15 minutes later at 5.39. This would have been a night landing because in November in the Northern Hemisphere, the sun sets early. Once they were on the ground, Cooper instructed the flight crew to take the plane to an isolated place on the tarmac away from the terminal. This place was brightly lit so that it would be possible to see anybody coming up on the plane, so no sneaking up in the darkness. And Cooper made them close all the window shades in the cabin to thwart any snipers that law enforcement might have outside. The airline's operation manager, a man named Al Lee, then came up to the plane to deliver the parachutes, Cooper demanded, as well as the $200,000, which he had in a knapsack. Lee approached the plane wearing his street clothes so that Cooper wouldn't mistake his airline uniform for a police uniform. When Lee got up to the plane, he went to the aft staircase. We should say a word about the aft staircase because it's rather unusual. What do the listeners and viewers need to know? Airplanes typically have a door at the front, and sometimes they have doors farther back on the sides of the plane, like the ones that are over the wings. Sometimes they have doors further back than that, and you can wheel up a movable staircase to those doors so that people can get on and off the plane. But the Boeing 727 that Cooper was in had an unusual staircase that was built into the plane itself. This staircase, called the aft staircase rather than just being a rear staircase, was at the very back of the plane, and it wasn't on the side of the plane. Instead, it was located centrally, in the middle at the very end of the plane, so that it opened down underneath what you could think of as the plane's butt. This was an unusual design feature, and the 727 was the only model that had it. When Ali got to the plane, he went up to the aft staircase and gave the parachutes and money to flight attendant Tina Mucklow. Once he knew that these had been delivered, Cooper then allowed all the passengers off the plane. He also allowed Florence Schaffner, the flight attendant he originally handed the note to, to leave as well. And he allowed the senior flight attendant, Alice Hancock, to leave. That left uh, the cabin crew and Tina Mucklow on board. Cooper also inspected the contents of the money bag that he had been given to make sure that the money was there and that it was as he had specified. Tina Mucklow then tried to joke with him by saying, There's a lot of money in that bag. Can I have some? Cooper then took one of the packets of $120 bills, or $2,000 worth over $13,000 today, and gave it to her. She immediately handed it back, explaining that stewardesses weren't allowed to accept gratuities from passengers. In fact, at one point, Cooper tried to tip all of the female crew members at one point or another, but they all declined. Now that he had the money, how was Cooper planning to make his escape? The fact that he had demanded the parachutes strongly suggested that he was planning to jump from the plane, but he didn't say this outright. Instead, he had them refuel the plane and get ready for takeoff again. The refueling process also took a while because when they started pumping fuel into the plane's tanks, the tanker truck suffered a vapor lock. Vapor lock's not a term you hear a lot these days. I'm somewhat familiar with it, but younger listeners may not know it. So what is vapor lock? It's a term you used to hear a lot more. Uh, I remember watching an old episode of Bewitched as a kid where Samantha's powers stopped working because she got a vapor lock from not using them regularly. In the real world, a vapor lock is a problem that occurs when liquid fuel vaporizes and becomes a gas in a fuel delivery system. As a result, the vaporized fuel can't be pumped effectively because the system is designed to move liquid around rather than gas. 
Vapor locks used to be common with old style gasoline engines, but engines have been redesigned so that vapor locks aren't nearly as common these days, which is why you don't hear the term much anymore. In this case, the fuel tanker suffered a vapor lock when trying to refuel the plane, so they had to bring up a second tanker truck to finish the refueling. Cooper got annoyed with how long the refueling was taking, and as he talked, it became clear that he knew about the refueling process. What else happened while they were on the ground? A Federal Aviation Administration official asked to have a meeting with Cooper, but he said no. On board the plane, they also had a discussion of where they would be going when they took off because they needed to file a flight plan. Cooper said that they wouldn't be going to Cuba, but to a pleasant place. He then wrote a note for Tina Mucklow to give to the captain. Going to Mexico City, or any place in Mexico, nonstop, gear down, flaps down. Don't go over 10,000 feet altitude. All cabin lights out. Do not again land in the States for fuel or any other reason. No one behind the first class section. The problem was that Mexico City is 2,332 miles by air from Seattle. But the plane could only carry enough fuel to go around 1,000 miles, and any location in Mexico was more than 1,000 miles, so they'd need to refuel again before they got there. They talked about where they might do this, and eventually Cooper said that they could land in Reno, Nevada and refuel there. This implied that Cooper would be staying on the plane for quite a long time, but there were also clues he was planning on doing something else. And what kind of clues suggested that? He gave some really strange instructions about how they should fly the plane once they took off. Instead of ascending to a normal cruising altitude, he wanted them to stay low. Normal cruising altitude for a plane this size would be 30,000 feet or more, and a Boeing 727 could go up to 42,000 feet. But Cooper wanted them to stay below 10,000 feet. As a result, he wanted them to leave the cabin unpressurized. He also wanted them to go really slow, as slow as possible, without causing the airplane to stall and fall out of the sky. He wanted them to go only around 115 miles per hour, and he wanted them to keep the wing flaps lowered by 15 degrees, which would force the plane to fly slow. He also wanted them to leave the landing gear down, and he wanted them to take off with the aft staircase down. That caused an argument with the airline's home office, and Northwest said it was dangerous to take off with the aft staircase down. Cooper said it wasn't dangerous, but he let them keep it up anyway. So put that all together, Cooper wanted them to stay low, go slow, and take off with the staircase down. That's not a man who's planning to stay on the plane for very long. Certainly not all the way to Mexico City or even Reno. When did they finally take off? At 7.40 p.m., two hours after they'd landed. Counting Cooper, there were now just five people on board. The others were Captain William Scott, First Officer William Ratisak, Flight Engineer Harold Anderson, and Flight Attendant Tina Mucklow. But they weren't alone in the sky. Who else was up there? You'll recall that McCord Air Force Base was nearby, so the authorities had two F-106 fighter planes shadow the flight. One of the F-106s flew behind and above it, and the other behind and below it. They also had a Lockheed T-33 trainer plane divert from an Air National Guard mission and shadow the airplane too, though it ran low on fuel and had to turn back near the Oregon-California border. What did Cooper do after they were in the air? He had Tina Mucklow show him how to open the rear door and the aft staircase, she said that this was the only aspect of the plane he didn't seem to already know about. He then told her to go to the rear of the front compartment, first class, close the curtain, and not let anyone come through the curtains. As she was doing that, she turned and saw Cooper with a nylon parachute cord tied around his waist, which he was using to secure the bank's money bag since they had not delivered the money in a knapsack as he requested. You know, he could have just put the knapsack on, but now he needed to tie the bank money bag to himself. Mucklow also pleaded with him 
to take the briefcase bomb with him, and he said he would either do that or he'd disarm it before he left. He ended up taking it with him, so the authorities didn't have it to examine afterwards. At one point, the cockpit got a call from Cooper. What did he say to them? He said he couldn't get the aft staircase to lower. First Officer Radisak uh, got on the intercom and asked if he could help, but Cooper said no. The pilot then said he'd level off the plane and slow down to make it easier to get the stairs lowered. And this was the last time anybody talked to Cooper. Around 8 p.m., 20 minutes into the second flight, a light went on in the cockpit telling the crew that the aft staircase had been lowered. The crew then noticed the air pressure in the plane had decreased because their ears popped, indicating that Cooper had gotten the aft door open. At 8.13, 33 minutes into the flight, the plane suddenly bounced. Its tail section went up, indicating that there was now less weight in the back of the plane, so this was likely when Cooper jumped. There has been speculation that he might have actually jumped up and down inside the plane to make it bounce and disguise the precise time he left, but 8.13 is probably the accurate time. The crew then continued to fly to Reno. Since they weren't sure if Cooper was still on board, Tina Mucklow got on the intercom and tried calling to Cooper, asking him to cooperate and telling him they had to land. When he didn't reply, she said, Sir, we're going to land anyway, but the aircraft may be structurally damaged, and we may not be able to take off after we've landed. And so they landed at 10.15 p.m. with the aft staircase still down. Once on the ground, the pilots parked away from the terminal. The pilot came out to where Tina Mucklow was behind the first-class curtain and called out to Cooper, asking him to cooperate and if he had any, in any additional instructions, but Cooper didn't answer. The pilot and Mucklow then did a quick search, but did not find either Cooper or the bomb. So the FBI, state troopers, sheriff's deputies, and Reno police surrounded the plane. They whipped out their guns, searched the plane, and confirmed that Cooper wasn't there. He had vanished into the night. And before we get to the rest of our mystery, I'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including... Austin K, Timothy J, Jedediah H, Arthur B, and Edward C. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. So, Jimmy, where do we go from here, and what theories are there about D.B. Cooper? In terms of where we go from here, we'll be discussing what happened next and the investigation that followed, along with some later developments. In terms of the theories about Cooper, there are minor mysteries, like did he really have a bomb on board? There are middling mysteries, like did he survive his jump from the plane? And then there's the big mystery, who was he? And of course, there's the faith perspective on what he did. Before we start, we need to say something about the big mystery, the identity of D.B. Cooper. What is that? I know there's a lot of interest in D.B. Cooper. Uh, people would love for me to be able to name who he was, and I'd love to be able to do that. Many people, though, have been proposed as subjects. In fact, the FBI considered more than a thousand different men that they classified as serious suspects. And Wikipedia's page on D.B. Cooper alone lists 14 major suspects. One of the most famous ones even lived here in San Diego, and I'd love to tell you about him. But ultimately, I can't identify who Cooper was because the evidence I've seen so far doesn't allow me to do that. I'll keep an open mind, and who knows, in a future episode, I may be able to announce who I think D.B. Cooper was, but not at this point. That presents me with a choice. I could plow through the common suspects, like the 14 different ones on Wikipedia's page, and point out why the evidence against them is inconclusive. But there are so many 
that this would involve spending a lot of podcast time without an ultimate payoff, and I don't want to bore the listeners by doing that. So my decision, at least for now, is to avoid going through a suspect list and commenting on the individual members. That will allow us to keep this as a one-parter rather than a two- or three-parter that doesn't even have a conclusive result. But should I get better evidence in the future, we'll certainly take another look. For the moment, instead of trying to deduce who D.B. Cooper was specifically, we'll see what we can deduce, what we can deduce about him generally. That is, the kind of man he was, what his motive may have been, and what kind of characteristics a good suspect would have. Okay, so let's start with uh, looking at the faith perspective. What can we say about D.B. Cooper, what he did from the faith perspective? One of the Ten Commandments is, Thou shalt not steal, and Cooper stole $200,000. As a result of that, the burden of proof would be on Cooper to justify his action, because under ordinary circumstances, taking money that doesn't legally belong to you is the sin of theft. But it isn't in all cases. There are situations where it's morally justifiable to take things that don't legally belong to you. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, The Seventh Commandment forbids theft, that is, usurping another pro another's property against the reasonable will of the owner. There is no theft if consent can be presumed or if refusal is contrary to reason and the universal destination of goods. This is the case in obvious and urgent necessity when the only way to provide for immediate essential needs, food, shelter, clothing, is to put at one's disposal and use the property of others. So theft is usurping another's property against the reasonable will of the owner. For Cooper's act of taking $200,000 to have been justified, the owner's desire to keep the money would have to be unreasonable. That would be the case if Cooper had an urgent necessity for the money, for example, perhaps needing to pay medical bills to keep someone alive and having no other way to get the money. However, we can't simply assume that he had such a need because ordinarily thieves don't. They're taking money because they want it, not because of an urgent necessity they have no other way of dealing with. And not knowing the details of Cooper's life, the presumption must be that this was an illicit act of theft, not a case of legitimate taking. And theft wasn't the only thing Cooper did. He also hijacked a plane. And in order to do that, he had to threaten the lives of the people on board the plane. That's why they gave him the money, the parachutes, and followed his directions with respect to the plane. That's why he claimed to have a bomb and showed the flight attendant what appeared to be a bomb. Do you think it was a real bomb? It's possible. Back in 1970, you and your carry-ons weren't searched before you got on a plane, so it would have been entirely possible for him to have gotten eight sticks of dynamite and wired them up into a bomb that he then showed Florence Schaffner. There's certainly nothing on the plane that would have stopped that from happening, and dynamite would have been easier to get back in 1970 than it is today. However, you didn't need to actually have a bomb in order to take over a plane. You only needed to be able to make a credible claim to having one. So Cooper could have made a dummy bomb and brought it on board the plane and then showed it to Schaffner. That actually would have been easier than getting dynamite and building a real one. And it would have been safer if anything went wrong. As a result, if I had to guess, I'd guess that Cooper didn't really have a bomb, but he certainly could have. If he didn't, would that affect the moral character of his act? It would still have been gravely wrong. Even if the bomb was fake, he was still committing terroristic threatening and putting people in fear of their lives. The fact that the flight crew kept this secret from the passengers also doesn't change matters, because the flight crew were in fear of their own lives and in fear of the lives of the passengers in their care. The fact that Cooper acted polite, calm, and considerate may make him a bit more likable as a kind of gentleman terrorist, but he's still a terrorist in the sense that he's using grave fear to get others to comply with his demands. And even if he had an extreme necessity for $200,000 for some reason, 
that doesn't justify the means he used to get it. You can't kill or threaten to kill innocent people like this. So I conclude that what D.B. Cooper did simply was not morally justifiable. Okay. What can we say about D.B. Cooper from the reason perspective? What happened with the investigation after he jumped? Well, naturally, they dusted the plane for fingerprints, and the FBI found 66 unidentified prints, though they don't know which, if any, are Cooper's. They also found that he'd left his black J.C. Penney clip-on tie behind, as well as a mother-of-pearl tie clip. They also found eight stubs from his Raleigh cigarettes, which could be really good for getting DNA off of today because they'd have his saliva, but at some point they lost the cigarette butt, so we don't have them. When they looked at the two parachutes he'd left behind, they found that he'd opened one of them and cut two of the shroud lines or suspension lines that attach to the parachute's canopy. He may have used one of these to tie the money bag shut and another to tie the money bag to his body, consistent with what Tina Mucklow saw when she was returning to the cockpit. They also interviewed witnesses, including passengers, and developed composite sketches of him with police artists, two of which you see in this episode's artwork. How quickly did they start getting suspects? Very quickly, and not simply because of the sketches. The hijacker had listed himself as Dan Cooper, and the authorities thought, hmm, perhaps he was stupid enough to use his real name. <laughs> At least they thought they should check out that possibility. Or, even if Dan Cooper wasn't his real name, maybe he'd used that or a similar alias in the past, and that alias might be known to the police. So they looked, and it turned out that there was a man in Oregon with the name D.B. Cooper, who had a minor record with the police. The Portland police then questioned the real D.B. Cooper and found he wasn't the hijacker. But the reporters got it wrong, confusing the name of the innocent man with the hijacker and listing him as D.B. Cooper instead of Dan Cooper in their stories. And that's how the name D.B. Cooper passed into popular into popular currency. What about tracking him from where he jumped out of the plane? Did they try to find where he landed on the ground? They did, but they failed. The problem was they weren't sure exactly where the plane was when he jumped. This was in the days before GPS. I mean, you had to use physical maps. And so they only have a rough estimate of where they were. And there were no eyewitnesses to the jump. The F-106 uh, pilots were behind the plane shadowing it, but it was dark, and there was a heavy rainstorm when he jumped, and they didn't see anything. They ended up doing a reenactment where they took the same type of plane up and then pushed a 200-pound sled out of the aft stairwell, which made the same kind of upward jerk of the rear of the plane that the crew had experienced at 813 on the night of the hijacking. So they concluded that 813 was the probable time of the jump, but they still didn't know precisely where the plane had been. They estimated it to have been over the Lewis River in southwestern Washington. But even if they had known precisely where the plane was, they couldn't predict where Cooper would have landed. That would have been affected by factors like how the wind was blowing at different altitudes, and it would depend on the precise moment he pulled the ripcord and let the parachute deploy, if he pulled the ripcord at all. And if and when he did so were things they simply didn't know. They had to have come up with a rough estimate of the landing zone. So where was it? They thought it might have been on the southernmost part of Mount St. Helens. That's the volcano in Washington that explosively detonated almost 10 years later in 1980. So they searched there and the neighboring counties, and it ended up being perhaps the biggest and most extensive manhunt in U.S. history. They got helicopters and searched the wilderness. They got FBI and sheriff's deputies out searching the mountains on foot. And they did door-to-door -door searches of farmhouses and cabins in case Cooper had visited one of them or was holed up there. There also were some local lakes in the area, so they got patrol boats out on those. They got airplanes and helicopters from Oregon 
uh, from the Oregon Army National Guard to retrace the flight path of the original plane from Reno to Seattle. Then in the spring, four months after the hijacking, they did it all over again. They had teams of FBI agents together with 200 Army soldiers, Air Force personnel, National Guardsmen, and civilians do an extensive ground search. It took a total of 36 days between March and April of 1972. They also got a marine salvage company to use a submarine to go through one of the lakes, but no luck. They didn't find anything that would help with the investigation. What about trying to trace them through the $200,000? They had microfilm of the bills and thus a record of all the serial numbers on them. They did, and in December, they gave a list of the serial numbers to businesses that handled a lot of cash, where he'd be able to either spend the money or change it for other money that wouldn't have the serial numbers they had on file. This included businesses like banks, racetracks, and casinos. You can imagine, for example, how Cooper could go into, cas into a casino, turn a bunch of cash into chips, gamble as much or as little as he liked, and then cash out the chips for other money that didn't have the serial numbers on it. They also gave the numbers to law enforcement agencies all over the world, and to incentivize people to be on the lookout for the numbers, Northwest Orient Airlines offered a reward of 15% of any monies recovered up to $25,000. But these efforts were unavailing. So a few months after the hijacking in early 1972, President Richard Nixon's attorney general at the time, John Mitchell, who was one of the key figures in the Watergate scandal we discussed all the way back in Episode 7, released the serial numbers to the public. Did this produce any results? Not what they were hoping for. Instead, two guys used the serial numbers to print counterfeit $20 bills with the serial numbers and then use them in a confidence trick. They contacted a reporter from the magazine Newsweek named Carl Fleming and showed the bills to him to convince him that they were in contact with D.B. Cooper. They then swindled Newsweek out of $30,000 for an exclusive interview with a man who turned out to be a fake D.B. Cooper. And it was all just a trick. For the next uh, couple of years, newspapers offered rewards for anyone turning in any of the bills, but none came in. Eventually, in 1975, the airline's insurer paid off the airline and reimbursed it for the lost money. Were the authorities able to refine any of their original estimates about Cooper and where he landed? Ultimately, yes. Based on additional information, they concluded that their original estimate that he may have landed on the southern part of Mount St. Helens ended up being revised. Uh, they then concluded that he may have come down in a drainage area of the Washougal River. Unfortunately, when this area was searched, they didn't find anything. And the place is close enough to Mount St. Helens that any evidence that may have been there was covered or destroyed in the 1980 eruption. Did anybody ever find any physical evidence on the ground? In 1978, seven years after the hijacking, a deer hunter found a placard with instructions for how to lower the aft staircase on a 727. That would almost certainly be from the plane, given how unique the aft staircase of a 727 was. And it was within the general flight path of the plane, but it didn't lead to further discoveries. A more sensational find occurred two years later in 1980, when a family by the name of Ingram was vacationing on the Columbia River. Eight-year-old Brian Ingram was raking the riverbank for a campfire they were going to build when he discovered three packets of the money that D.B. Cooper had. Two of them were packs of $120 bills, and the third was a pack of $90 $20 bills. All told, they came to $5,800 of the $200,000 that Cooper had. And there was something strange, because the third pack should have had 100 bills, but it only had 90, meaning that 10 of the $20 bills, or $200, had been removed. What condition were the bills in after having been buried in the Sandy Riverbank for the last nine years? 
not great. They had water damage and they had partially disintegrated, but they were still bound by the original rubber bands and were still in the same order as when they had been given to Cooper. In 1986, after a lot of negotiations, the FBI kept 14 of the bills as evidence, but let Brian Ingram and the airline's insurance company split the rest. In 2008, Brian sold 15 of his bills at an auction where they sold for $37,000. After the government caused inflation, the 15 bills would have been worth $1,600 face value, but because they had been D.B. Cooper's ransom money, they went for $37,000, meaning that at auction, they were 25 times more valuable than they otherwise would have been. Were they able to figure out anything about the crime after the bills were found? Not really. The discovery of the bills raised a lot more questions than it answered. There's a ton of stuff they didn't know, such as when Cooper lost the bills. It's possible that he was handling them on the airplane and dropped them out of the aft stairwell in the wind. I don't know that that's what happened, but it could tie in to why 10 of the bills were missing from one of the bundles. Maybe Cooper pulled $200 out of one of them to put in his pocket and accidentally dropped the three bundles. On the other hand, if that's what happened, then why were the three bundles found together? Why weren't they scattered widely across the landscape by the wind? And why the three bundles were together is a mystery for other theories, too. It doesn't look like they were deliberately buried but rather that they wash down the Columbia River from somewhere upstream. In that case, why did they end up together rather than being separated by the water currents, unless Cooper lost all hundred bundles that he had been given, in which case three might end up together by random chance. But if that's what happened, why haven't the other bundles been found in all this time? Unless they have and people have just kept them. But then you'd expect money from with the right serial numbers to turn up somewhere, unless the serial numbers were somehow missed. One possibility is that Cooper was on the ground when he lost these bundles. Maybe he was taking 10 of the bills out of one of the bundles when he dropped them and either didn't realize that he'd lost them or was unable to retrieve them in the dark and the rain that he landed in. But ultimately, we don't know what happened, and there are a ton of un unanswered questions here. What about the question of his survival? Do we have evidence that he survived the jump? In thinking about this, we need to look at two questions. First, did he make it to the ground safely? And by safely, I just mean alive. I mean, he could have jumped and been injured, but nevertheless been alive. And then second, did he make it back to civilization or did he die in the wilderness? When it comes to the first question, the FBI quickly speculated that he didn't survive the initial jump. And what's the argument for that? Well, the basic argument is that it's supposed to have been a very dangerous jump that he attempted. Among other factors, it was dark, it was in a rainstorm, there was a strong wind. Taking into account the plane's speed, it's estimated that he would have been jumping into a 172 mile an hour wind. And it was very cold. The estimated air temperature was 15 degrees Fahrenheit, which is below the freezing point of water of 32 degrees Fahrenheit. But darkness, rain, wind, and cold shouldn't kill a man in the short time that it would take to parachute from 10,000 feet. Correct. Based on checking I did of skydiving sites, it looks like if Cooper jumped from 10,000 feet, he would have been in free fall for about 30 seconds and opened the chute at around 5,000 feet if he did it correctly. Then, after he opened the chute, it would have taken about four minutes to float down to the surface if the parachute deployed correctly. So he would have been on the surface in less than five minutes if everything worked the way it should have, or in 60 seconds if he didn't pull the ripcord and the chute didn't work. Um, in the latter case, he very likely would have been killed on impact. Would we have found his body if that had happened? Not necessarily. The woods of the Pacific Northwest are huge, and it's entirely possible for a body to go undiscovered all this time out in the wilderness. 
especially if it was covered when Mount St. Helens blew in 1980. So, no, we wouldn't necessarily expect to have found a body. But, on the other hand, dark, rain, wind, and cold would not have killed him in the five minutes before he reached the ground. That does bring us to the question of whether he would have survived getting out of the wilderness if he made it to the ground alive. So what can we say here? Well, here the FBI has a point, which is that Cooper was not dressed for the weather he would find once he got to the ground. He was wearing a business suit, a trench coat, and loafers. The loafers easily could have been sucked off his feet by the wind, so he may not have even had shoes when he got to the ground. And a trench coat is lightweight and will protect you from rain, but not from intense cold. He also would have a long trek out on foot, which he would not have been able to do immediately because it was dark and rainy, meaning he couldn't use the moon or the stars to navigate by. So he would have had to wait until it was starting to get light so he could determine which direction was east. Or, I don't know, maybe he had a compass in his pocket and could have gotten an early start. But either way, it's a long trek in the cold, rain, and dark. And then he would have had to make it back to civilization on his own, which would likely mean hiking many miles until he encountered a road and then hitchhiking from there. And that's actually something that might have been easier for him to do since he was wearing a business suit and would look more socially acceptable and less threatening than if he looked like a counterculture, counterculture hippie back in 1971. What if he had an accomplice waiting to pick him up? Some people have proposed that, but I don't think it's particularly likely. Without a precisely timed jump, which he didn't have since he had trouble getting, he didn't know when the plane would take off, and then he had trouble getting the door down, so he couldn't have precisely timed when he jumped, he wouldn't know where he was going to land. And that meant he wouldn't know how long it would take for him to get to a road or which road he would land near, so he couldn't have an accomplice waiting for him. Yeah, and without a cell phone and GPS, how would he and an accomplice even make contact? He'd need to go to somewhere that there was a payphone he could use. Even if he found a house, uh, it's not likely that the owners would have let him use a landline. Back in 1971, you had to pay long distance charges or call collect. And even if they did let him use the phone, that would leave a paper trail to his accomplice, making it easier for him to get caught. So I don't think it's particularly likely that he had an accomplice, at least not until he could get to somewhere there was a payphone where he could make a call without it being traceable. What would the argument be that Cooper died after landing? If something went wrong with the parachute, he could have been killed on impact, even if he fell into a tree. Uh, if the chute worked, he still could have been injured in the jump and then died of exposure. Or if he wasn't injured, he could have landed so far away from civilization that he died of exposure before he could make it back. What do you make of the FBI's speculation that he did die, either in the jump or before getting back to a town? I'm not particularly impressed. Law enforcement never likes to admit that someone got away, so it's very easy for them to say, this was a really dangerous jump. He probably didn't survive. Crime doesn't pay, kids. But the truth is that it's not as dangerous as people make it sound. In World War II, paratroopers made jumps every bit as dangerous as this one, and even more so. And even today, there are skydiving services that let you recreate the D.B. Cooper jump just for fun. In private skydiving services, they actually have Boeing 727s with the aft staircase, and people pay extra money just to be able to do the D.B. Cooper jump. So it's not as dangerous as some make it sound. What do you think the best arguments are for and against him having survived? I think the best argument against him surviving is that they never found anybody spending any of the money he stole. If he made it back, you'd expect him to spend the money, and after it re-entered circulation, you'd think that some of the $20 bills would have been picked up by their serial numbers. On the other hand, 
I don't know how persuasive that argument is because this was the days before optical character recognition and widespread bill scanning. So I don't know what the probability is that they would have picked up any of these bills if they emerged back into circulation after a few years. What about the argument for his survival? Here the argument is that if he had died, the FBI should have discovered this fact. Not by finding a body. That could easily be lost in, in the wilderness. Instead, by finding out that the person who D.B. Cooper really was had disappeared. He jumped on the night of Wednesday, November 24th, the day before Thanksgiving. That means he would have a four-day weekend to hike out of the woods and get back to wherever he lived. In fact, he likely planned to jump the day before Thanksgiving precisely in order to have that four-day weekend to get back home. And then, given the respectable, professional kind of man he seemed to be, he would be expected to report back to work on Monday or a few days later if he'd arranged to take some time off after the holiday. But the FBI checked for people disappearing over the 1971 Thanksgiving holiday, and they didn't find anybody that was a good candidate for D.B. Cooper. That suggests that whoever he was, he was able to get back home and resume his normal life without being reported as someone who disappeared. On the other hand, that's not a foolproof argument either, since it's possible he wasn't reported missing. So. I'm not sure what to think. The fact the money never got reported argues against his survival, and the fact no person with his description was reported missing in the right time frame argues for his survival. Let's assume he did survive and go for the big question, or as much of it as we can go for. Who was D.B. Cooper? You've said that we won't be able to name him, but what can we figure out about the kind of man he was and who would make a good suspect? Well, the first thing to say is that he was a very calm man with a good bit of self-control. He didn't behave as if he was violent or hyped up on adrenaline during the hijacking, in marked contrast to the standard way hijackers behaved. He also, though, did have a thrill-seeking streak in him, because only a thrill-seeker would come up with this kind of plan, making your escape by jumping out of an airplane in the dark in the rain. He also was considerate and polite towards the flight crew, paying for his drinks even after he took control of the plane and trying to tip the flight attendants and offering to have the airline bring in meals for them while they were on the ground. He also was left-handed, which eliminates 90% of the population as suspects because only about 10% of people are left-handed. He also was clearly a very intelligent man. He put a lot of planning and forethought into what he did, as became obvious as the plan unfolded. The fact he demanded multiple parachutes so his couldn't be sabotaged is just one illustration of that. What about his personal background? Does his choice of the name Dan Cooper suggest anything? Potentially. As we mentioned, there was a line of comic books in Europe about a Royal Canadian Air Force aviator named Dan Cooper. These were popular in Belgium, and they were written in French, but they had never been translated into English or sold in America. As a result, some have suggested that Cooper may have been a serviceman who encountered them while stationed in Europe. On the other hand, they were sold in Canada, so he could have spent time in Canada, either as an American living there or if he was a Canadian citizen. And when he demanded the money, he used an unusual phrase, saying that he wanted 200000 in negotiable American currency. That's not something an American citizen would naturally say, either in 1971 or today. We might say things like, I want $200,000 in small unmarked bills, but we wouldn't say, I want $200,000 in negotiable American currency. The fact he used this language has suggested to some that he might not be American. And since he didn't have a notable accent to American ears, Canadian would be the most likely option as English-speaking Canadian accents and certain American accents like Northern Midwest can sound similar 
to American ears. Also, you'll notice this took place in Oregon and Washington, which are states up near the Canadian border. He also had significant knowledge of the airplane and how it worked. Could that suggest a connection to the aviation industry? He did have quite significant knowledge of the Boeing 727 he hijacked. For example, he, for example, he knew details about the refueling process. He also knew how slow and low a Boeing 727 could fly without stalling, and he knew about setting the flaps on the wings to a 15-degree angle to achieve this, and that was something specific to this model of the plane. A Boeing 727 also was the ideal one for him to have picked for this operation. Uniquely, it had an aft staircase that he could use to jump out of in midair. This staircase was also positioned in a way that the exhaust from the rear engines wouldn't cause him much difficulty, and the plane was unusual in that it could fly at slower speeds and lower altitudes than most aircraft without stalling. Furthermore, the aft staircase could be opened directly without having to go to the cockpit, meaning that he could do it himself and not risk the flight crew overpowering him upon coming up into the cockpit where they would outnumber him. He also knew something that the public didn't know because it had not been announced. What was that? That the plane's aft staircase could be lowered while in flight. You'll recall that he initially wanted the plane to take off with the staircase down, the airline said that was dangerous, but Cooper said it wasn't. He didn't fight them, though, and let them take off with the stairs up, meaning he knew they'd have to be lowered in flight. And that feature wasn't in the publicity about this model of the plane. So he did have significant knowledge of the plane, suggesting prior experience with aviation. What kind of connection to aviation may he have had? There are a number of possibilities. One is that he was a member of the Air Force. For example, he could have been a pilot, a paratrooper, or a cargo loader. In fact, in the CIA was using Boeing 727s to drop agents and supplies behind enemy lines in the Vietnam War. So he could have even had prior experience with the plane there. That might have been why he thought it was safe to take off with the stairs down because he'd seen it done. On the other hand, he might have had connections with the civilian side of the aviation industry. He could have worked at a plant that built airplanes or been a mechanic or another worker at an airport that had to know about specific models of planes. But it's possible that he was just a civilian who was an aviation hobbyist and learned all this stuff on his own, though I think that's less probable than him having some professional connection with the industry. And why is that? Some have suggested that he might have been a pilot because he recognized Tacoma from the air while they were flying over it. But I don't find that persuasive. I can recognize San Diego from the air when I've been flying into it from a business trip. And I don't even fly much. It's not like it's hard to recognize well-known landmarks. What I find more significant is the fact that he knew it took 20 minutes to drive from the SeaTac airport to McCord Air Force Base. In 1971, you couldn't just go on Google Maps and look up how long a thing like that would take. And if you check Google Maps today, like I did, you'll see that his estimate is a little on the light side. Without traffic, today it would take about 35 or 40 minutes to get from the airport to McCord Air Force Base, though it might be faster if you broke the speed limit. But the fact he knew even, a, even an approximate travel time off the top of his head is significant. For purposes of comparison, uh, San Diego, where I live, is a military town, so there are lots of bases around here. But I don't know the driving times between them and the airport off the top of my head. I'd have to check Google Maps. The fact that Cooper did know this suggests he had prior experience with the military base and the civilian airport, and that suggests some kind of connection with the aviation industry that would let him have a reason to travel between both places, either that or it suggests a military connection, so that if he wasn't a local, he previously would have landed at the airport and then driven to the base. Given that he used a parachute to escape, how likely is it that he was an expert paratrooper? 
it's certain that he had some previous experience jumping out of planes. I mean, I'd never strap on a parachute for the first time and leap out never having done it before. So I think he definitely had prior experience. At a minimum, that would indicate he'd tra taken training as a civilian skydiver. But given his aviation and possible military connections, he may well have had parachute training in the military. That doesn't necessarily mean he was a paratrooper, though, and there are some indications he may not have been. For example, he did a couple of things that are considered mistakes with the parachutes. One is that the reserve chute he took actually wasn't functional. In their hurry to meet his demands, the local skydiving school accidentally gave him a chute and messed up in the process of doing it. One of the reserve chutes they gave him was a dummy, meaning it was a demonstration only model for use in classrooms. And it had been sewn shut and marked that it was a dummy. So this was an accident. They were not trying to kill Cooper. But it's argued that someone who is an expert jumper never would have made the mistake of strapping on a clearly marked dummy chute. But I don't think that this is a particularly convincing argument because in the heat of the moment, people make mistakes. You know, when, the, when they're in the middle of committing a major crime and tying money bags around themselves and are about to jump out of an airplane, I mean, after all, the skydiving school grabbed the dummy in the heat of the moment and they were experts. So... Cooper was under even more pressure than they were, so he could have grabbed the dummy by mistake and still have been an expert, too. And what's the other mistake he's said to have made? The primary shoot that he took was older and considerably, well, it was considered technically not as good as the one he left behind. But I don't find this argument convincing either. It could have been he was just more familiar with the older model than the spiffy, fancy, snazzy new one. Uh, for purposes of comparison, suppose I demanded someone bring me four iPhones to help me commit a crime. If they brought me different models, I'd pick the iPhone I was most familiar with, not the newest and jazziest one, as Apple would have likely altered the controls and the user interface, so I wouldn't be as familiar with them. So even though the newer one might be technically better, I, would ha I wouldn't have a feel for how to use it in a pinch that I would with an older model. Also, the parachute he did take was a military model. So if Cooper had been in the military several years earlier, he might have been familiar with and more comfortable with an older military model parachute. On the other hand, Cooper neither brought nor demanded that he be given a protective helmet when he jumped out of the plane, which some also have taken as a sign he wasn't an expert jumper. So while he certainly had some experience leaping out of planes, it's possible that he may not have been an expert as a paratrooper would be. If he wasn't a paratrooper, what other kind of military job might he have had where he would have received parachute training? One possibility that's been suggested is that he may have been a cargo loader. These guys throw cargo out of airplanes that are in flight. So they have to be used to standing in front of open doors and hatches while the plane is in motion, like the Boeing 727s the CIA had been using to drop agents and cargo in the Vietnam War. But if you're standing next to an open door while the plane is off the ground, you need to be wearing a parachute in case you fall out. And so cargo loaders get basic parachute training, even though it's not the same as the extensive training paratroopers get. And yes, it's possible Cooper could have been a cargo loader on one of the CIA flights using a Boeing 727 in Vietnam. This is speculation, and we really don't know what his specific connection to aviation was, but it's possible. With all the new technology we have now, has anything been discovered about Cooper using modern forensics? We don't have a lot of physical evidence because he didn't leave much behind, but there have been some forensic discoveries. Between 2009 and 2017, it was announced that studies had revealed some very interesting things had been found on Cooper's clip-on tie. 
These included spores from the lycopodium plant, which is known as ground pine or creeping cedar, fragments of the metallic elements aluminum, bismuth, cerium, and also pure titanium, and minerals like strontium sulfide. You know, some of those substances are rare or hard to come by, so what could explain them? Lycopodium spores have a variety of uses, but it's been suggested that they could have come from a pharmaceutical product of some kind. And some of the metals are quite unusual. For example, pure unalloyed titanium was much less common in the 1970s than it is now, and apparently it was only used in metal fabrication and production plants or chemical companies where it was used to store highly corrosive things. Cerium and strontium sulfide also were rare, and applications at the time included plants that manufactured cathode ray tubes, like for televisions, and a supersonic transport plane that Boeing was trying to develop. That could mean Cooper was a Boeing employee, which could also be how he knew so much about 727s. But he also could have worked somewhere else at a manufacturing plant where he might have been a manager or an engineer, since his tie was exposed to these metals. Ordinary workers at manufacturing plants tended not to wear ties because they would get in their way and could get caught in machinery. But managers and designers did wear them. What's the current status of the investigation into D.B. Cooper? In 2016, 45 years after the hijacking, the FBI announced that they were suspending active investigation into the case. They said they needed to devote resources to other more pressing cases, which is understandable after all this time. However, they've made tons of information about the D.B. Cooper investigation available on their website, and they've said they will consider anything the public can bring to their attention, especially if it deals with physical evidence involving the parachutes or the ransom money. Could Cooper even be prosecuted at this late date? Wouldn't the statute of limitations on his crimes have run out? Actually, he could still be prosecuted. While the statute of limitations has arguably run out, the authorities took steps to make sure he could still face justice for his crimes. In 1976, five years after the hijacking, the statute of limitations became a concern, and so a Portland, Oregon grand jury filed an, an indictment in absentia against John Doe, a.k.a. Dan Cooper, for air piracy. As a result, legal proceedings against him were started during the period when the statute of limitations was in effect, and if they're ever able to identify him, those proceedings can resume. This means that if D.B. Cooper is alive today, he has reason to stay hidden and not come forward and confess to his crimes. How old would Cooper be if he was alive today? The witnesses who saw him estimated he was in his mid-40s 50 years ago, so he would be in his mid-90s today. And he was a heavy cigarette smoker, so he may not be around today. What's our best chance for catching D.B. Cooper in the future, or at least figuring out who he was? Could we find him through other means, like we caught the Golden State Killer through new DNA technology, like we discussed in episode 38? It's possible. Searching modern DNA databases using old DNA from crime, crime scenes to identify a criminal's family of origin is one of our best ways of solving cold cases. And as with Joseph D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer, I'm confident many cases will be solved this way in coming years. In fact, many already have been solved this way. In this case, the FBI announced in 2007 that they'd been able to get a partial DNA sample from Cooper's clip-on tie. Unfortunately, they don't have proof that the DNA came from Cooper. It could have come from someone else, and the FBI has acknowledged that it's hard to draw conclusions from what they got. But it's possible that the samples could one day be matched to a public DNA database and identify Cooper's family of origin. If only they hadn't lost the filters from the cigarettes, which would definitely have his DNA on them. Mm. So let's talk about the legacy of D.B. Cooper. What's changed as a result of his hijacking? One of the first things that happened was a series of copycat hijackings. D.B. Cooper seemed to get away with the cash, so a bunch of people thought, I'll do the same thing. 
In the following year, 1972, 15 different men tried to do the same thing, though none of them were successful. However, at least one of the hijackers, Richard McCoy, successfully jumped out of the plane with the cash he got. It was another Boeing 727, and he used the aft staircase. When he jumped, the plane was at 16,000 feet rather than Cooper's 10,000. It was also going 200 miles an hour instead of 115 miles an hour, and McCoy survived. So Cooper's jump wasn't as super dangerous as it's sometimes made to sound. However, McCoy did make mistakes, and they caught him later on. Then they tightened up security, and the copycat stopped until 1980. And the guy who tried in 1980 has an amazing story. Here's how Wikipedia summarizes it. On July 11, 1980, Glenn K. Tripp seized Northwest Flight 608 at Seattle-Tacoma Airport, demanding $600,000, $100,000 by an independent account, two parachutes, and the assassination of his boss. A quick-thinking flight attendant secretly drugged Tripp's alcoholic beverage with Valium. After a 10-hour standoff, during which Tripp reduced his demands to three cheeseburgers and a ground vehicle in which to escape, he was apprehended. But on January 21, 1983, while still on probation, he hijacked the same Northwest flight, this time en route, and demanded to be flown to Afghanistan. When the plane landed in Portland, he was shot and killed by FBI agents. So he's got a tragic end, but the story has really funny elements. I love how he reduced his initial demand of a large sum of money and the assassination of his boss, something that would never have been granted, to just three cheeseburgers and a car. <laughs> I, I also love how the flight attendant slipped him a Mickey when he ordered a drink. And then three years later, while on probation, he hijacks the very same flight. And demanded to go to Afghanistan, which was being occupied by the Soviet Union at yeah, the time. Yeah. <laughs> so what did the FAA do to tighten security? In 1973, the Federal Aviation Administration required airlines to search all passengers and their bags before they could get on planes. The new policy sparked a bunch of lawsuits because people said this was an unreasonable search and violated their rights under the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which protects people against unreasonable searches and seizures. But the courts ruled that these searches were okay as long as they applied to everybody, so they weren't being applied selectively, and as long as they were limited to looking for weapons and explosives. As a result, the number of hijackings dropped from 31 in 1972 to just two hijackings in 1973. Incidentally, one of those two was a man who wanted to crash the airliner into the White House and kill President Nixon, foreshadowing 9-11. The FAA also required all Boeing 727s to be fitted with a device now known as a Cooper vane or Dan Cooper switch or DB Cooper device. It's a little spring-loaded wedge on the outside of the aircraft. When the plane takes off, the airflow turns the wedge so that it blocks the stairs and prevents them from being opened from the inside during flight, preventing anybody from doing what Cooper did. Then, when the plane lands and the airflow stops, the spring pulls the wedge back so that you could, so that it doesn't block the door, and you could open the stairs from the inside in the event of an emergency landing to let passengers out. They also began installing peepholes in cockpit doors so that flight crews could observe passengers without opening the door, but they didn't mandate locks on the doors until after 9-11. What impact did D.B. Cooper have on popular culture? Quite a bit, since he stole from a big corporation rather than ordinary people, and because he got away with it, folks began thinking of him as a kind of modern-day Robin Hood. However, as far as we know, he never gave any money to the poor, though he did try to tip the flight attendants. Novelty shops along the West Coast started selling T-shirts with D.B. Cooper, Where Are You? written on them. <laughs> 
Songs were written about him, like Chuck Brodsky's The Ballad of D.B. Cooper, which we'll hear at the end of this episode. And he's been featured in novels, comics, movies, and TV shows. Perhaps most recently, the Disney Plus Marvel Cinematic Universe TV show Loki had an episode in which it was revealed that Loki himself was D.B. Cooper after having lost a bet with Thor. Yeah, from the flight deck, Captain William A. Scott at North Mastarian Airlines, 305 on the Seattle. Time today, approximately... Bourbon and soda. Thank you. Absolutely. Is there anything else I can do for you, sir? I suppose we'll find out, won't we? Uh, miss? Yes, Mr. Kipper? You might want to take a look at that note. I have a bomb. In the Pacific Northwest, restaurants and bowling alleys even hold events based on D.B. Cooper, and there's a general store and bar that holds a Cooper Day celebration on the anniversary that features a D.B. Cooper look-alike contest. Okay, Jimmy, so what is your bottom line on D.B. Cooper? D.B. Cooper was an intelligent criminal who escaped with the money, though it's not for certain whether he survived to enjoy it. While he was better than many hijackers, apparently being polite and considerate to the flight crew, he nevertheless stole a large sum of money and used terroristic threats to do it. It's understandable that the public continues to be fascinated with him and his dramatic escape, and as I continue to review the evidence in the case, we may have a future episode of Mysterious World where we look into some of the more promising suspects. And Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the viewers and listeners on this topic? We'll have links to Jeffrey Gray's book, Skyjack, The Hunt for D.B. Cooper, Skip Porteous and Robert Blevins' book, Into the Blast, Drew Beeson's book, Paratrooper of Fortune, Robert H. Edwards' book, D.B. Cooper and Flight 305, Reexamining the Hijacking and the Disappearance, which is actually just coming out on November 24th. Also a link to Chuck Brodsky's album the, with The Ballad of D.B. Cooper, so you can buy that. Articles on D.B. Cooper, the FBI files that they have on their website about D.B. Cooper, a link to an article about the Dan Cooper comics, and also a, a, a cover from one of the comics of Dan Cooper skydiving out of a plane. We'll have an article on how D.B. Cooper got his name, an article on air aircraft hijacking, Monty Python's brief Take This Bus to Cuba sketch, also uh, some uh, interviews with skydivers where they weigh in on the jump, information on vapor locks, terroristic threats, and the Cooper vein that was then required to be put on these doors. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? Well, uh, we're doing a couple of updates for you based on recent episodes. A couple of episodes ago, uh, I, we reported a story where some dinosaur DNA is said to have been discovered in China. But like any time you see a science headline, you wait a few days or a week or two for it to be challenged because that's probably what's going to happen. And it is what happened in this case. So we'll have a link to a new story uh, challenging the idea that dinosaur DNA has been found in China. Also, having just discussed the possibility of life on Mars, um, we mentioned how frequently we will see people saying things like, we have no evidence of life on Mars, when in fact we have a bunch of evidence for life on Mars. It's just not evidence that has been regarded as convincing by a majority in the scientific community. But you nevertheless hear people saying, we have no evidence by which they really mean some evidence, just not as much as I want. This is a persistent idiosyncrasy of how people write stories, whether it's a science story about life on Mars or a paranormal story or a UFO story. They'll say, we have no evidence for UFOs. Yeah, except for all the evidence we do, you know, um, and I really hate that. But I was heartened by seeing a link to a new confidence-based uh, way of assessing claims for life that uh, is under discussion where as, as 
the science community gets more evidence for extraterrestrial life instead of just saying we have no evidence or we found it there's a way to gauge the state of the evidence in terms of how much confidence the current state of evidence gives us and so it would be a more sophisticated way of, of presenting the information to the public so we'll have a link to where you can read about that and notice here and i'm just going to read the first little bit of it but here's how it begins even though we have not found any evidence of extraterrestrial life so far that's not to say we shouldn't be prepared for the day when it could change after all many scientists think that alien life is a distinct possibility if not an outright probability while we have yet to turn up a whisper of hard evidence to support the hypothetical existence of life beyond earth we are nonetheless always looking for it you notice how right in this article itself on let's introduce a graded confidence-based scale instead of all or nothing they're using all or nothing rhetoric right at the beginning of the article twice despite all the evidence we actually covered in our last two episodes for life on mars so glad that there's thought in terms of let's use a more sophisticated and accurate way of presenting the data now go back and apply it to mars <laughs> all right i agree so that's it from us from us on this uh, episode we would love to hear from you what are your theories about db cooper and his mysterious disappearance you can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the jimmy akins mysterious world facebook page or send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world. So, Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week is the Thanksgiving holiday here in the United States. Uh, so we'll have a Weird Questions episode and we'll be talking about where Jesus got his Y chromosome, time travel and murder, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and many more weird subjects. Excellent. Folks, be sure to join the StarQuest fan club by texting STARQUEST to 66866. Send STARQUEST to 66866. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Fearvento Law PLLC, specializing in adult guardianships and conservatorships, probate and estate planning matters, accepting clients throughout Michigan, taking into account your individual health care, financial, and religious needs. Visit fearventolaw.com, F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest. He was carrying a briefcase when he stepped aboard the plane. Northwest 305 from Portland on the tarmac in the rain. Dressed in loafers in a dark suit Underneath an overcoat White shirt and a black tie That was loose around the throat And it was Thanksgiving Eve Back in 1971 He had on a pair of sunglasses And there wasn't any sun He used the name Dan Cooper When he paid for his flight It was going to Seattle On that a nasty night They taxi to the runway Went up to the sky Cooper let a little bit of time go by Before he called the flight attendant he Told her to stay calm that inside his briefcase He said he had a bomb Two hundred thousand dollars Twenty dollar bills A plane to crew some parachutes And no one would get killed They landed in Seattle The authorities complied 
All the passengers were let off The crew remained inside The plane took off for Portland Just Cooper and the crew It wasn't quite an hour When he bid them all adieu First he tipped his one of them Two thousand bucks apiece He was such a nice man They later told police That a little service doorway In the rear of the plane Cooper jumped into the darkness Into the freezing rain They say that with the wind chill It was sixty-nine below Not much chance that he'd survive But if he did Where did he go? Some guy who lived in Oregon By the name of D.B. Cooper Was arrested and interrogated By a couple of state troopers It wasn't him who did it The lawman had no luck But the papers ran the story And the name D.B. Cooper stuck It was on a family picnic Eight or nine years later Six thousand muddy dollars Found by a second grader On the banks of the Columbia Which would have been on his route The authorities confirmed That it was part of Cooper's loot Cooper was Today is still a mystery The only unsolved Skyjacking in aviation History No one's ever tried to claim A very large reward No one's ever seen Him since He bailed out the door The divers searched the river Every summer Still For an article of clothing Dollar bill, a briefcase or a wallet, with some kind of ID to determine who this D.B. Cooper might actually be. He was carrying a briefcase when he stepped aboard the plane.